Hi there, I'm Pastor Cliff Gleason, and I want to thank you for tuning in today to our worship service. Here at the Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church, we worship Jesus Christ as our Creator, our Lord, our Savior, and our coming King. And we hope that you will enjoy this service with us, that you'll be inspired by the teaching and the music and every part of our service. So sit back and enjoy, and thank you for being with us today. Good morning. You know, most of the times I'll tell stories about my farm, right? Yeah. I'm not going to today. <laughs> no, this is another story. This is something that I love to do. I love to mountain climb. When I was younger, I used to go out and, with ropes and everything and hang off the sides of cliffs. Climber and climber. Yeah, a climber. And, but this one, this story is going to be about a hike that we took. And I don't know if any of you know Pastor Rick Kuntz, but Pastor Rick and I used to hike a lot together. And we'd, we'd do mountains in the wintertime. And we were going to go up Mount Monroe. Now, Mount Monroe is right next to Mount Washington. And Mount Washington is the tallest mountain in New England. Climber. Yeah. Do you like to climb? Yeah. Yeah. Climber. Climber. <laughs> I did go up that mountain once. You went up Mount Washington? Yep. In a car. We did. Well, in a car. Okay. Well, to a mountain climber, that's cheating, but that's, that's okay. It's okay, but it's pretty up there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah very windy. Well, you know, that day, this day that I'm going to tell you about, we decided to take and go up. And before we went, Pastor Rick decided, as in all of our climbs, we would pray before we'd go up. And Rick didn't have many weekends off. So this was like his only weekend off, his only Sunday off for months. And so he wanted to go up to the top of Mount Monroe. Well, we got up to an area, just a place called Lake of the Clouds, which is kind of on the side of Mount Washington. And then from there, you go up the opposite direction from Mount Washington to Mount Monroe. Well, it was in the winter time, and we got up there, and the clouds came in. And Lake of the Clouds Hut is probably almost the size of this church. But the clouds were so thick, we were as close as from here to the back wall, and we couldn't see it because the clouds were so thick. And I'm saying to Rick, uh-huh. Eh, this isn't real good to go up to go up above tree line and and stuff and and he says well let's just walk a little bit further over to where the trail starts to go up Mount Monroe and as we were getting ready to go over some other people were just coming back from Mount Monroe and it normally would take maybe to come down off from Monroe down to there maybe a half an hour and it had taken them over two hours because they there's these piles of rocks called cairns, and that's what marks the trail. And what they would have to do is one person would have to go out and find the next cairn and haul it to the other people so they could come because you couldn't see from one to the next. And I'm like, Rick, this is crazy. You know, I just want to go down. You know, my idea of mountain climbing is I want to be able to go again. <laughs> you know. You know, let's just go down. And, and he's like, oh, come on, let's just go up to the trailhead. Okay. So we get up to it. We finally found the trailhead. There's a big sign there. And, you know, we were 15 feet away from it and could just barely just start to see the outline of the sign. And we said, and there was another friend with us, too. And we're like, Rick, this is, this is crazy. 
we, we need to go down. And after much talking to Rick, he decided, OK, we'll go down. So we worked our way down to where the Lake of the Clouds hut is. And I said, hold on a minute. i got to tie my shoe. And I stopped to tie my shoe. And all of a sudden, the wind changed direction. And we just stood there for a few minutes. And the wind was wind started blowing just the opposite direction of what it had been. And I looked up, and I could see the top of Mount Washington. And we turned around, and we looked. And we couldn't see Mount Monroe yet. And we stood there for probably another five minutes. And all of a sudden, we could see the top of Mount Monroe. And we looked at each other and said, let's go for it. And we went up, and we got to the top of Mount Monroe. And there was about, we could see about 100 miles. There had been a front that had blown out, but there was another one coming right behind it. And we had a little window of opportunity to get to the top of Mount Monroe, beautiful views from there. We, like I said, we could see about 100 miles from there. We got down. And it takes a couple hours to get from top of Mount Monroe back down to where our cars were. And by the time we got back down to the cars, we couldn't see the top of the mountains. We had just that little window of opportunity. You know, and like I said, I love to climb. You know, and it was a beautiful day, and it's a memorable day. But what really is memorable about that climb was how God answered a prayer. Rick only had like one, one day for months to be able to make this climb. And he prayed about it. And we, you know, and it was beautiful. God answered, our pra answered the prayer, and we had a beautiful day. You know, and how God just answers those simple prayers. You know, it wasn't a life and death thing that we made it to the top of Mount Monroe, but God cares so much for us that he gives us these wonderful gifts. And sometimes we just have to ask for these gifts, and he gives them to us. Amen. But we have to ask. So let's remember to pray about all sorts of things. The little things, not just big things, but little things like to have a nice day, to be able to reach the top of the mountain. And then God gives these wonderful gifts to us. So before we go back to our seats, why don't we bow our heads and we'll pray. Dear Jesus, we just want to thank you for answering prayers and how you want to give us wonderful gifts, but we need to learn to ask. And we just ask that you will help us to put you first and foremost and that we pray about everything. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me go back to your seats now. Let's take our Bibles. Turn to Psalm, Psalm 121. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And for those who may be watching by video, now's a good time to pause, get your Bible out, and find Psalm 121. I remember memorizing this one when I was either a primary or a junior at camp meeting one summer. And I want to keep on going and not just do verse 1, but I'm only going to do what verse 1 as Dan has asked. You can go to verse 2, that's fine. I'll take verse 2 then. <laughs> I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. May the Lord add his blessing this morning as Dan brings us the word. Good morning. The name of the study this morning is Peaks and Valleys and Valleys and Peaks. As the children's story, as I started out with the children's story, one thing that I love to do is climb. You know, there's nothing 
for me better than to be standing on top of a mountain. It just, it's just something about it. You know, and I just long to do it, long to make those climbs. It's but those valleys. <sighs> the valleys, they're the difficult ones. As a climber, you long for the peaks, but so much of your training is done in the valleys. Strength training, endurance training is done there. But it's all for the, all to make it to the top of the next mountain. You know, the training though, that the valleys, in the valleys, makes it possible to make it to the top of the next mountain. And I believe that spiritually, that's the same way. That we do our training in the valleys to have that spiritual mountaintop experience. I want to start off by telling you of a mountaintop experience, both physical and spiritual. A friend of mine was going through a really hard time had a lot of calamities that had happened in his life. And his wife called one morning and said that he needed prayers. That he had taken off and he had gone over to Mount Kearsarge. And he was hanging out there day and night. And that he needed prayers. So I started praying about it, and I walked, as I was walking down the stairs, for those of you who don't know, I used to play bagpipes. I sold them many years ago, but I, I played pipes. Not good. <laughs> Not really good. But, you know, when someone asked if I played pipes, I said I flogged them instead. <laughs> You know, and I was walking down the stairs, and my bagpipe box was sitting there. And I had been pr playing, learning to play the song Be Still My Soul, our opening song. And as I walked down past the, the pipe box, I felt the Lord was speaking and saying, Be Still My Soul. And I said, you know, he goes, go to Mount Kearsash and play it. So, I told Kathy, I'm not going to work today. I'm going to Mount Kearsash. So I went up there, and, I, and his car wasn't there. This friend's car wasn't there. And I actually turned around, and I started heading out. And as I was heading out, he drove in. I turned around and I said to the, the ranger, I says, can I go back in? I had already paid to go in. He goes, yeah, go ahead. I get up to the parking lot. There's a parking lot partway up Kearsage, and then there's a trail that goes from the parking lot up to the top, and there's a fire tower and stuff up there. So I grabbed my bagpipes out of the car, and I started hiking up. I didn't know where this friend had gone. I saw his car in the parking lot. And I'd get up to a certain spot and I would say, here Lord, and, he'd, and, it, was, and it just kept impressing, go further. And this happened a number of times on the way up. And I got to the point I couldn't go any further. I was standing on the top of the mountain. And there was other people up there and they said, you gonna play that, those things? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm just asking the Lord where to play them, and he said, here. And I turned around and looked, and it's kind of like an amphitheater. They had the shape of the, shape of the mountain that was in that section. And I looked down at the bottom. There was probably a half to three quarters of a mile away, and I could see my friend sitting out on, a, out on this clearing. Wow. 
So no matter what happens, any noise is going to go right down to him. Well, bagpipes are known to make a lot of noise. <laughs> and a friend of mine who was in the Black Watch said that the reason that they marched was to get away from the noise of the pipers. <laughs> but that was, you know, he, um, so I started playing Be Still My Soul. And I got done with that song, and then I was just impressed to play He Leadeth Me. And then I walked back down, and I found the trail over to where this friend of mine was. And I didn't know all the struggles that he was going through. He was going, he, he, like I said, there had been some calamities in his family. Um, but I didn't know the, the spiritual struggles he was going through. But he was journaling, and I walked over and I spoke to him, and he says, oh, it is you. <laughs> he says, let me read something to you. And he said, I was praying, and he didn't tell me what he was praying about. He said, but from behind me, the sounds of bagpipes playing Be Still My Soul. And he says, it answered my prayer. He says, and then it played, he leadeth me. And he says, I don't know if it's an angel or what. You know, all the training that was done in the valley, all the noise that I made on those pipes trying to learn that, learn those tunes, Kathy could attest to those. You know, when you make a mistake on a pipe, it's not like making a mistake on a guitar where it's just a little twang. It's, everyone hears it. But the training was done in the valley for that one mountaintop experience. For God to use that song and that set of pipes to reach a person that was in trouble. You know, you probably heard my voice cracking telling the story. You know, it's a, even to, now, even to this day, it's such an emotional thing, that mountaintop experience. You know, if we didn't have the valley experiences, we would never be able to experience the mountaintop experiences. If everything was a mountaintop experience, it would just become normal, everyday, ho-hum. But God's asking us to do the training in the valley so he can use us for mountaintop experiences to reach people. You know, scripture has some beautiful mountaintop experiences. You know, how about Abraham? What mountain was he told to go to? Moriah. He was told to take his son, his only son, the son of promise, and take him up and sacrifice him. Now, Abraham had been told that it was through his son that the descend, all of his descendants would be. Had Isaac had children? Not yet. So how, if he takes and kills him on the altar, how is there going to be all the descendants? Abraham knew that he could trust God's word. And he takes the journey to Moriah. You want to talk about a valley experience? How would you like to have been told that? How would you have handled that? How would I have handled it? You 
You know, I can't imagine that valley experience. And Isaac saying to him, you know, you've got the wood, you've got the fire, you've got the knife. Where's the sacrifice? God will provide. God will provide. They get to the top, they build the altar. And Isaac's still saying, where's the sacrifice? And he tells him what the sacrifice is. Think of it. Abraham's an old man. Isaac's a young guy. I mean, he could have taken his father and said, no way. But he trusted his father and he trusted God. He's on the altar and Abraham's raising the knife. And God speaks to him. He's so used to hearing God's voice yes. that he stops. And he says, don't hurt him. Now I know that you, you trust me. I now know that you love me. I know that you believe me. And from behind them, they hear the voice of a ram caught in the thicket. God will provide. And he even names the mountain, that place in the mountain, God will provide. You want to talk about a mountaintop experience? That's incredible. To come face to face with God. Maybe he didn't see God's face, but he saw him as the loving God that he is. How about Moses? Moses had spent 40 years of training in the valley, in the desert. You know, that's, that's a hard part for me to be on something, would be something on a flat land for 40 years. And then he comes out of that and he goes another 40 years. But before that 40 years is up, when it, just at the beginning of that one, he's called to the top of Mount Sinai. And he goes up and he talks with God. God gives him the Ten Commandments. He asks God to see him if he could see God, and God put his hand over him so he couldn't see the whole glory. But you know, he spent 40 days up there without eating, without drinking, just talking with God. And when he came down, what did the people say to him? Cover your face. We can't take and look at you. You are lit up so bright because you've been with God. He put a veil on his face so the people could even look at him. To me, that's another incredible mountaintop experience. He spent all those years of training in the valley and going up and meeting God up, up on the mountain. And why did he do that? Because God gave him a message to the people. He was given all the information that they needed. And he came back down and God used him. The valleys and the peaks go together. You know, but Moses didn't stop just at that mountaintop experience. Let's go to Deuteronomy 34. The last chapter of Deuteronomy. The children of Israel are standing on the edge of the promised land. We're going to start with verse 1. And it says, 
Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar, and the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants, and I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. God is saying to, to Moses, Look, I am faithful. I'm fulfilling the promises. He says, I'm going to show you this land, but you're not crossing over. I can't let you cross over. He says, but I'm faithful. You have led them to the edge of the promised land like I asked you to, and I'm faithful to give it to them. And it says, so Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. It says, he wasn't sick, he wasn't dying of old age. God laid, let him go to sleep. He says, you can't cross over. But before I lay you to sleep, I'm going to show you that it was worth it for you bringing them here. And I'm going to show you that I am faithful to fulfill my promises. It says, and the children of Israel wept for Moses on the plains of Moab 30 days, so the day of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. You know, he had another mountaintop experience. But notice where God buried him it was in the valley. You know, and it's kind of interesting that we see, we read this, and we think, okay, Moses is, is ended. But he didn't end there. He had another mountaintop experience. Does anyone know when, what the other mountaintop experience Moses had? Mount the Mount Transfiguration. God raised him from the dead. And when Christ was transfigured up on the mountain, who's there? Moses and Elijah. Two men that had had mountaintop experiences with a lot of training in the valley. And he's there to encourage Christ. That's an incredible mountaintop experience. All the training that he had in the valleys, he had these wonderful mountaintop experiences. And how about Elijah? He goes from a valley up to Mount Carmel. God's faithful. He uses him to show that he is the true God. And you know, once God shows himself by accepting the sacrifice and the 
the prophets of Baal couldn't prevail against that. He stays up on the mountain and he prays seven times. And he says, when he sees that cloud about the size of a man's fist, he says, we need to get off this mountain because it's going to rain. And he goes to the valley. And what happens to him in the valley? He hears a rumor that someone's going to kill him. Jezebel's going to kill him. And where does he go? Back up to a mountain. And he's up on a mountain and he's in a cave. Just think, God takes care of him there. He has angels feed him. And then in the cave, this, all the things that happened. And God wasn't in all of these mighty things that he could have been afraid of. But he hears God's still small voice speaking to him. God took him back up to a mountain to assure him that God is faithful. One thing that I keep seeing about in these mountaintop experiences, we see God is faithful. God will provide. God will use you to take and fulfill what he wants you to do, and he will give you the strength and the power to do it. There's other things that happen in the valleys. David and Goliath happened in the valley. Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones. God uses us not only on the mountaintops, he uses us in the valleys. He gives us those high things every once in a while to show us how faithful he is and how we need to rely on him. Amen. There's a song by a contemporary Christian singer, Hills and Valleys, Torrin Wells, and in the, in the chorus, he says, you're the God of the hills and valleys. He says, you know, when I'm standing on the mountain, I didn't get there on my own. When I'm standing in the valleys, I know I'm not alone. Because you're the God of the hills and valleys. You know, and that's exactly what, what happens. We don't put ourselves up on top of those mountains. It's God that does it. When we're ready... And when we're in the valleys, sometimes even like David says, when I, even though I walk through the valley as shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You notice it says he walks through. He doesn't get left in the valley of the shadow of death. We walk through it. And I fear no evil because you are with me. Peaks and valleys... You know, my favorite passage, my favorite Bible hero has a, both a valley and a, and a peak, I mean, a valley and a mountain experience. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 6. Now they're dividing up the kingdoms. They've gone into the promised land. And they're dividing up the land. And it says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me and Kadesh Barnea. What happened in Kadesh Barnea? Spies. The spies. They were sent out from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. Twelve, twelve people went out. And only two people 
came back and said, we can do this. The other 10 said, no, we can't do it. And the two are the two old guys that are still left. Joshua and Caleb. And so Caleb is saying to Joshua, remember what, what God said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me, us two old guys. Remember that? He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him that was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who, who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. He was 40 years old when it happened. And he said, Where you walked, that will be your inheritance. That was 45 years. He's wandered in the valleys. You know, how many of us get impatient? And, you know, Lord, it's taken an awful long time to do this. And it's only two days. Or a week. And he's been going 45 years. It says, now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, for, for these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke the word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am, 85 years old. 85. He's waited 45 years for this promise. And he says, as yet... I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, now, then so now is my strength for, both war, for war, both for going out and coming in. He says, God has preserved me and kept me all these years for a reason. Yeah. And he says now, he says, now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that their cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. He says, I want that mountain. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to, to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. And Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. You know, God knew that he could trust Caleb. Yeah. All the years of, of wandering in the wilderness... Keep saying that Caleb wholly followed the Lord. All the training done in the valleys. And he still trusted God. 45 years, there was a promise given to him, and he did not forget that promise. And he believed that God would fulfill that promise. So when the inheritance comes up, he says, he says to Joshua, give me this mountain, the ones where the Anakims were. Who are the Anakimites? Giants. And it says, in the name of Hebron, formerly was Kerjeth Arba. Arba was the greatest among the Anakim. He was the biggest, toughest guy. And that's where Caleb says, that's the mountain I want. I want that mountain. And it says, Then 
the land had rest from war. Why was there rest from war? They conquered it. God won. God is faithful. He fulfilled his promises. Another mountaintop experience that shows God is faithful. If he's promised something, it'll get done. But he's looking for people like Caleb that wholly follow him. That take the training in the valleys and wholly follow him. Without the valleys, we can't have the mountain experiences. But I want to close with one last mountaintop experience. Let's turn to Revelation 14. Fourteen verse one. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him one hundred and forty four thousand, having his father's name written on their foreheads. You know, the hundred and forty four thousand stand with him on Mount Zion. Maybe we will be part of the 144,000. Maybe we won't. Maybe we will taste death before Christ comes. But there's an invitation to see the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And that is the ultimate mountaintop experience. And it's an invitation to all of us to see Jesus, the Lamb of God, standing on Mount Zion. In order for us to see that, we have the training here in the valleys. The valleys of this earth. Yeah, we're going to see some, some times that maybe aren't so easy. We, you know, Jesus says, you know, in this world you'll have tribulations. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And he is inviting us to share eternity with him. You know, we can be like Caleb's. Amen. To wholly follow God here in the wilderness, here in the valleys. So we can experience the ultimate mountaintop experience of seeing Jesus standing on Mount Zion. My prayer is that each of us will take the challenges of this earth, put it in God's hand because He is faithful. He will provide. He's called us to be His children. He has called us into the valleys for training so He can take us to the mountaintop and see Jesus standing on Mount Zion. Amen. Our closing song is 516.
bow our heads for the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Once again, I want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us through the media, and we're glad that you were able to enjoy this particular service. But we're hoping one day will come when soon you'll be able to come right to our facility. We're here at 241 Province Street in Laconia, and our services are on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock for the worship service, 9.30 if you want to come earlier for the Bible study. You're always welcome. We'd love to have you come. And there's a special thing that happens on the second Saturday of every month. That's our fellowship meal. And we'd love to you, for you to be able to be with us and to stay afterwards and enjoy the lunch with us. Now, you may also be inspired to want to study the Bible some more. And we do have different Bible study aids. We can provide something for you to study through the mail. Or we can come to your home. Or we can arrange a small group study here at the church. So be in contact with us and we will be able to set up something that will meet your needs as best we can. Thank you again and we look forward to meeting you. God bless you in every way.